Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Takalani, thank you for the introduction, and Simon, thank you for the invitation to be here with you this evening to talk about uh, the investment case for Africa and more specifically some investment ideas that sit inside of this investment case. Those of you who know Canon uh, will appreciate that this is against the backdrop of what we consider to be structural drivers or uh, put more simply a, uh, a supportive economic environment that makes uh, the argument for uh, investments or specific investment ideas in sub-Saharan Africa particularly compelling. If you, you know, if you if you have a look at this picture here, this really could be anywhere in Africa, uh, anywhere in the last uh, twenty or thirty years, and the transformation that is taking place, uh, in a word, is structural. If the economic uh, progress of sub-Saharan Africa was about high commodity prices, then at least, or perhaps we would have seen the sub-Saharan economy go into recession in 2009, when the world went into recession on the back uh, in the fallout of GFC. Uh, and in fact, uh, sub-Saharan Africa stayed out of recession in 2009, which doesn't prove, but suggests that there is something different going on. And the second uh, proposal that I would put, and I'm going to lead some more uh, detailed argument and evidence in a moment, but the second proposal that I would put is, if this was cyclical, it's unlikely that you are able to achieve elevated cyclical growth 15 years in a row. Uh, that at some point you have pulled away from the base and that you have achieved something that might look like escape velocity. My short argument to you this evening is I think that the economic story of the next generation is sub-Saharan Africa, in that the region is picking up where Southeast Asia started to clear its throat in the 1970s. And you are intimate with the successes of those stories. So the washing line it gets replaced with fiber optic cable. And the clothes become uh, vibrant, profitable outlets for Mr. Price and so on. Um, uh, this isn't uh, a sales evening, but just to give you some backdrop to, to Canon, uh, the business I started 15 years ago, uh, we consider ourselves to be a manager-owned uh, business in that uh, the people who uh, are invested in the business are the people who run the business, although uh, you'll also know that Peregrine, uh, the listed business, has a large stake in, uh, in Canon. We run uh, assets across three broad silos, which include institutional assets, and some of our institutional clients are listed here. Uh, segregated portfolios for high net worth individuals, where we will build a portfolio in your name, custom to suit your appetite and requirements. And then we have a small retail business. We don't run assets just in South Africa. We invest globally and some of the ideas that you see tonight sit in our sub-Saharan African uh, investment portfolio. We also run a global portfolio, uh, but you probably know us best for our South African investment record. And we'll be talking about some of the South African ideas also. This is our longest published track record. It's the best part of 14 years old, and it shows our performance relative to, well, relative to the place that builds the index. Uh, and this is Canon's uh, all equities portfolio versus the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, the question, uh, all share index, the question that uh, often or always want to propose to potential investors or clients is what would you rather have eight times your money or 12 and a half times your money? And everyone says that they'd rather have 12 and a half times their money. The reality is most people are either in eight times money or less. Uh, most investors, by definition, must be getting index returns, less fees, which means they're in the eight uh, result, not the 12 and a half result. Um, so our Superdogs portfolio has been running for a little longer, and over the uh, 18 years that we've been reporting performance on Superdogs, the market has done 12 times money, Superdogs has done 20 25 times money. And you know, we can ask the same question, where would you rather be? Just the name itself uh, suggests why most investors aren't there. 
uh, you know, why would I want to be in a dog portfolio? Dog is investor sentiment. And investor sentiment, I think, is our most powerful ally. Far from being an enemy, it's the most powerful ally. Because what it does is it uh, converts uh, great businesses into great investments. And if uh, great businesses are converted into great investments by negative investor sentiment, you're able to turn uh, sentiment to your favor. And I'll talk about one of my favorite ideas in this regard uh, in recent times, where about five years ago, we were able to invest into a South African engineering business, which had a market cap of 200 million rand, so small. Um, it had a market cap of 200 million rand. It had 300 million rand cash on the balance sheet. This is insanity uh, or it's sentiment. And the beauty of sentiment is it keeps recurring, uh, which means that you know, uh, we think that our investment approach is a gift that keeps giving. Of course, uh, the fact that we are working against the crowd and against sentiment means that our approach also commands or uh, demands, not commands, demands uh, discipline, and, uh, and adherence and conviction. So here's uh, a one-minute due diligence on Canon Asset Manager's investment process. Essentially, we're asking three questions. Buffett says investing uh, is simple but not easy, and I would agree with that observation. Uh, investing uh, is simple. I don't think you need a 120 IQ. Uh, to find great businesses at great prices. But perhaps what you do need is conviction and discipline, which is they are possibly the two hardest uh, to contain. Global financial crisis is a clear illustrator if we need any reminder. And in fact, in, uh, uh, if I can digress for a second, uh, Simon didn't invite me to talk this evening about some crazy valuations, but Victor from my investment team uh, is here, and he coined a term uh, in one of our recent conversations. Uh, we were talking about silly valuations, and Victor talks about two times silly. And he says, there's nothing that stops two times silly going to three times silly. Uh, he has, he, he, so you'll forgive me. I'm just going to press the pause button. There's some craziness going on in the world uh, capital market environment right now. You can buy BMW, which is a 100-year-old business. You know the brand. Uh, they come with indicators, although BMW drivers don't need them. Uh, we all have built-in indicators uh, as BMW drivers. Um, and BMW is trading at 10 times earnings. It's uh, got revenue of about $80 billion, and it has an enterprise value of about $100 billion. So its enterprise value is just a touch more than its revenue. Last year, they sold 2 million vehicles. They had their most profitable year ever. This year, they will sell even more, and they're likely to improve on their profit result. Or you can buy Tesla, which is a brilliant idea, but sold just 20,000 vehicles last year. Uh, that's compared to BMW's 2 million. Uh, it didn't make a profit. In fact, it made a loss. And it has a market cap of $30 billion which is one half of BMW's market cap. So Canon's investment approach insists that you buy BMW. And it's not about the spectacular growth. It's about buying good businesses at good prices and then waiting for sanity to prevail. So that's, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a, I'm stepping sideways, but I think that company example is an illustration of what attracts us to investments, that we're after three things that we want to conduct fundamental analysis, which is about understanding the business, the gears, the transmission mechanism of the company. What is it that this business does that turns accounting earnings into bottom line cash flow? Uh, the, the second is uh, that we want to find businesses of quality and substance. The moment you've bought uh, a business that quality and substance are absent, I think you've turned investing into speculation. And the third that we are after is to, under, uh, to appreciate that there is likely to be some catalyst uh, that releases or recognizes the same value that we see. In the absence of that catalyst, we're buying a value trap, uh, which is a mistake. And then we just drift sideways forever. And then we build portfolios which tend to be very concentrated. So our African portfolio has just 10 ideas in it. 
and that'll give you a sense of the types of portfolios and the style of our investment approach. Uh, being cavalier, I think, you know, if you've got an inv investment portfolio with 40 ideas uh, in it, I challenge you to name the 32nd idea uh, or the 35th idea. And if you can remember what the 35th idea is, to then talk about it in detail. Uh, so uh, this is the way uh, that we approach investment problems. But the point of departure, and it's really the essence of this evening's discussion, is to recognize that the environment is a critical driver of investment consequence. And that it's not just about buying businesses in the blind hope or faith that they convert into uh, great results. It's about understanding the environment in which your investment decisions are taken. And uh, firm-headedness or uh, determination itself is not an effective ingredient unless it's coupled with industry intelligence, uh, wisdom or um, insight about uh, the surroundings and the settings. And no better case in point than, you know, I, I don't even have to put the logo of the business up here. You know who this is, hey? This is Kodak. And this is a spectacular business. This is a spectacular business. By uh, the mid-1990s, it's 110 years old. It's established in the 1880s. Many people uh, consider this to be a product business that they manufacture film. I would venture that they're actually a technology business. And what Kodak does over the 110 years from 1880 to the mid-1990s is they build, own, develop, and then implement the technology that manufactures photographic film, uh, cinema, cinema to movie film. Um, <laughs> There's a, a good roadblock question. Um, cinematographic, is that the right word? You know what I mean. Huh? <laughs> That's the roadblock question. Um, and uh, medical film, scientific film, and so on. They build that technology. They have in-house uh, engineers that own and produce, the, that build, uh, produce, and therefore they own the technology. By 1995, they operate in 150 countries. They've got leading market share in every country they operate in, with the exception of Japan, where, of course, Fuji is the rock star. The market share that they've got, because it is a yawning market share, means that uh, their top line falls all the way to bottom line, and they boast spectacular profitability that isn't just accounting profitability, it's cash flow. Aswath Damodaran says, when you see an accounting statement uh, 128, accounting note 128, you know, what does that mean? Does anyone know? Accounting note 128. So Aswath Damodaran says it means that there's 127 notes before it. <laughs> Three levels of truth, uh, lies, damned lies, and accounting numbers. <laughs> so that you, know, you can torture the numbers to get them uh, to look like you want them. Uh, Kodak isn't in the business of torturing the numbers. They don't need to. Their accounting profit uh, translates very elegantly into powerful cash flow. They've got this superb mountain of cash. And their CEO proposal, their CEO's proposal in 1995 is the Berlin Wall has come down, 89. Eastern Europe is on fire. So they've been through that tough structural adjustment of the early 1990s. Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic are growing at you know, not 10 and 15. In fact, they're printing 20, 25% economic growth per annum. This most spectacular recovery out of the uh, East European winter. Latin America is eventually clearing its throat. Uh, they've done 50 years of kicking the can around, and eventually Latin America is awakening from its uh, structural straitjacket. So Brazil is doing sufficient stuff to become the bee in bricks. And Southeast Asia is uh, alive with opportunity. South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan are doing 8, 9, 10, 11% growth per annum. If we recognize that these regions house the bulk of the world's population, then 
it's easy to get from this emergence of developing economies to a proposal that all we have to do is wait for these customers to emerge and they'll leap straight into our arms, which is exactly the Kodak CEO's proposal. And if these uh, consumers are anything like me, for my 10th birthday in 1978, I got a Kodak Instamatic. Uh, it takes 24 photographs. And boy, I mean, that was a defining moment. Uh, these 20, uh, with a flash bulb on top. Uh, you, you remember that? Well, not everyone remembers the cube. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> don't say it aloud, Jillian. <laughs> But you get the cube on top, for just four flashes, and uh, you have to be very careful. For nighttime photography was expensive. Um, and, and maybe it's the equivalent of giving my 11-year-old uh, daughter an iPad, which she got for her birthday two months ago. That was the defining moment for her. She's arrived. This was the power of the brand. Kodak became a member of the Nifty 50. It was considered to be of such... Um, well, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Immune. Uh, and that it was just going on to ever greater things. Not to overwork the point, but 2012 Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Their market cap had gone from $40 billion to $80 million. Their employee headcount, 150,000 to 5,000. And what did they got wrong? Well, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, we know what they got spectacularly wrong, and they said that all we had to do was wait, and these consumers will leap straight into our arms. Instead, they leapt straight over Kodak into digital. Straight over Kodak into digital. You could have given Kodak a powerful piece of business intelligence in 1995. You could have told them that in 2013, more photographs will be taken than any year in history. And there were. <laughs> if my Samsung Galaxy is any evidence of this, uh, my son Saxon arrives home and he's got photographs of Kian's tonsils and Siabo's tonsils. These are his classmates. <laughs> so we take lots of photographs, but none of us use Kodak film. And, uh, the, well, this is just a lovely poet, uh, no, not a lovely, a tragic poetic twist in Kodak's story. The pro, they were the inventors of digital, uh, digital equipment. Kodak invented digital. And what they got busy with was obsessing about being so perfect at what was right in front of them. We were going to become the world's best film manufacturers whilst the world around them was changing. And it's not often that we afford ourselves the luxury, the privilege, and I would venture against the backdrop of this evening's conversation, the critical importance of stepping back and getting this perspective, which is a Kodak joke, I suppose. Anyway, so, you know, these are the things. It's, it's about, is this investment, is it a survivor? And not just is it, is it a survivor, is it likely to thrive in this investment setting? And what it produces is this a sustainable idea that has a repeatable competitive advantage. And then, if I can buy this at the right price, I found a good investment. Okay. So let me talk uh, uh, just a, for a couple of minutes about what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, for most of recent modern economic history, is considered to be uh, the dark continent, a hopeless case. The Economist's cover of the early 2000s is, you know, it, it's been caricatured so many times, uh, it's probably not worth repeating. But you'll remember that Economist cover where they spoke about the hopeless continent. And there was good reason to think of this as the hopeless continent. This is per capita income from, uh, per capita income over the last 100 years. And whilst the world is getting on with the business of achieving economic well-being and social uh, inclusion and integration, Sub-Saharan Africa is limping sideways. And th this is the poorest place in the world. And it's not that it's one or two poor countries. This is overwhelmingly poor, with the lowest per capita incomes uh, displayed in places like Mozambique, uh, Mali, Chad, 
of just a few hundred dollars per, per annum. But the economist got this forecast or this uh, assessment of the environment spectacularly wrong. Because from the end of, or fr from the start of the noughties to the end of last year, Sub Saharan Africa produced economic growth 2% better than the rest of the world per annum for the last 15 years. 2% faster than the rest of the world for the last 15 years. Sub Saharan African government balance sheets, I'll come to this in a moment. Remember the Glen Eagles agreement of the late 1990s. This was to bail out, they were called the HIPSIs. Uh, and you know you've made your mark when you've got your own acronym. The HIPSIs, H-I-P-C, were highly indebted poor countries. Those highly indebted poor countries, most of them, half of them were sub-Saharan African. The proposal was they had no ability to buy themselves out of their debt. They were debt trapped, to put it simply. And if you look at sub-Saharan African government balance sheets today, they are the strongest in the world in aggregate. If you combine the governments uh, collectively and put the, that uh, government debt up against the size of the economies, they have the most powerful balance sheets in the world. A number of them are starting sovereign wealth funds. Ghana uh, has recently announced the launch of a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, Nigeria is contemplating this. Um, and in October of last year, the U.S. government shut down for six weeks because they couldn't pay their debt. So, you know, there's a Kodak moment. And <laughs> so here's the 2% more per annum. This is Sub-Saharan Africa's growth versus Asia. Sub-Saharan Africa has grown faster than Asia in the last decade. And Asia has been uh, the tiger. Uh, they earn the title, the East Asian Tigers, and not without good cause. They're growing fast. They're transforming themselves. And they are in charge of their destiny. They are not the consequence of some external environment. My, uh, the head of the business school uh, where I teach, the uh, Gordon Institute, Nick Benadel, tells the lovely story of jumping into a taxi cab in Singapore. And you know now that Singapore's per capita income has gone from $100 per person in 1950 to almost $35,000 per person today. That's not a bad result. Eh? <laughs> and 1950 to today is two generations. So Nick, and if you know him, uh, Raj, he gets under your skin in about 30 seconds and feels your pulse and he knows exactly what's going on. So he works out from this ta taxi driver that he's been a taxi driver his whole life, that his parents were chicken farmers, and that his, he has two young adult children. One's a chemist and the other is a nuclear physicist. That's what happens when you get structural transformation behind you. When you are in charge of your destiny, you're not the consequence of some external force. Some names in this basket. Rwanda has taken some shape. Uh, Kenya is taking this shape. And Ghana, not Nigeria. Ghana. But we can come back to that if you want to talk about uh, individual country ideas. There are a number of structural factors then that are going on. And here's, here are some of the ideas. The first structural factor, admittedly, is external. And it is elevated commodity prices. Through the 1990s, oil was $10 and $20 a barrel. It's hard to imagine $10 and $20 oil today. In fact, I would say it is a close to impossible outcome. During the GFC, oil uh, reached a crisis price of $30, but it quickly rebounded. And what's going on here is that as emerging markets are emerging, they're becoming vibrant consumers. BMW went to, this is BMW's second cameo appearance, it's not intentional, but BMW went to China in 1994, and in that year they sold 800 BMWs. This year they sell 900 BMWs a day. Uh, the, the Chinese vehicle market now is the largest in the world, having come from of little consequence in the early 1990s to overtake the United States 18 months ago. That's for global market share. And vehicle penetration per 1,000 people, there are about 100 cars in China per 1,000 people. The United States is about 700 cars per 1,000 people. <laughs> 
and China is already bigger than the United States. So if the Chinese become American, what this does for oil prices, steel prices, platinum prices, and so on is almost hard to imagine. Uh, but this suggests, and I don't have data here to illustrate it, but just my first point, uh, our uh, thinking at um, Canon is that th as these 6 billion emerging out of se 6 billion out of 7 billion people emerge, it translates into elevated commodity prices. That's good news for a important sector of the South African economy also, which is being overlooked right now. There's lovely opportunities in the resource counters. The second uh, structural change that's going on is that these balance sheets have got stronger and stronger. So this is Sub-Saharan Africa's government debt to GDP. And this is what happens when you build debt. You get slow growth. And this is what happens when you retire debt. You get fast growth. It's no coincidence that Sub-Saharan African economies are growing fast and that advanced countries are growing slowly. They've got, the advanced guys have got themselves into debt traps. It's, again, it's not a conversation for tonight, but if you want the status of the U.S. balance sheet, government balance sheet, in a word, that word is easy. It begins with B, as bankrupt. There is no way the U.S. government will pay the debt that they have without defaulting in some shape or form. Europe last week reaches for more uh, monetary stimulus. You've got to love this, 0.1% uh, interest rates now, 0.15%. Uh, and negative deposit rates. <laughs> is, is this a rabbit? <laughs> this is the World Competitiveness Report uh, Institutional Strength and Competitiveness Scores. The sub-Saharan economies aren't going up uninterrupted, but they're going up. And this breaks the mold of the last, uh, well, not the last 15 years. This is the shape of the last 15 years, but the 80s and 90s has been reshaped that this now is about institutional strength, which translates into economic management uh, uh, and policy reforms. I don't think we can ignore the demographic dividend. Uh, the Chinese population, the workforce stopped growing last year. That's an interesting uh, consequence of their one-child policy, uh, which in Chinese is Wan Si Shao. And Wan Si Shao says, later, longer, fewer. If you wait longer to have your children, uh, if you uh, put uh, bigger gaps between having those children, you will have fewer children. So that was the moral uh, suasion. But the legislative suasion was if you had two children, we wouldn't pay for their schooling or their health care and you would pay higher tax rates. So there was a, a number of reasons in China not to have more than one child. And that meant that th that policy was put in place in the 70s. That meant that today, if you go and speak to Chinese kids, they've got uh, two parents, uh, and uh, there's four grandparents behind those two parents. Their demographic structure has done this. The Chinese uh, population is the first in uh, recent times to become uh, to become old or to start becoming old before they've become rich. Most countries get rich, then they stop having children. Japan. Last year, they sold more adult diapers in Japan than infant diapers. They, uh, <laughs> it's a memorable... <laughs> That's a throwaway statistic. <laughs> um, but, you know, a, a demographic... Uh, this demographic transformation isn't a dividend unless it is coupled with education and healthcare, which are the key levers in economic inclusion and social mobility. So it's critical not just that Sub-Saharan Africa has um, a young population coming into the workforce, but also that this population is economically and socially mobile. And there is a wealth of evidence that suggests that this most certainly is the case. I can't help but stay with the Chinese numbers just for a moment and, and India, uh, because in both China and India, there have been demographic uh, disruptions. The Indian population hasn't stopped having children, but they've stopped having girls, whereas the Chinese population has stopped having children and they've stopped having girls. So whilst the population is stagnant, 
they're replacing boys and girls with just boys because of the social value that's put onto boys in China. And it leads to infanticide, uh, the abandonment of girl children, and so on. There's about 50 million too many boys in China today. That's an accident waiting to happen. Um, if the movie, what's it called? The Hangover uh, is anything to, to go by. <laughs> Uh, not not all of our evidence is uh, empirical. Some of it, some of it is anecdotal. <laughs> and in uh, uh, in India, uh, again, I'm, uh, I mean, this is a sweeping statement, so I need to be careful with it. But one component of Indian uh, culture says that when girls are, are married, they get married with their share of the family balance sheet, and for that reason, girls are considered to be a deficit or, or to the family balance sheet. <laughs> There's a daughter having a look at her dad here. <laughs> and uh, so in India, there is a shortage of girls being born. Um, in fact, recently uh, in India, uh, is it what happens before you're born? Someone help me with the word. Is it prenatal? The prenatal. You can no longer have prenatal scans uh, to determine the gender of your child. Because if you find out it's a girl, uh, there's a good chance that she's aborted. Anyway, those are uh, those are footnotes that don't have a lot to do with tonight's conversation. Uh, more uh, tonight's conversation is the fact that there is not just this demographic uh, transformation, but that these young people that are coming into the workforce are increasingly educated. They have increasing access to uh, health care. They're increasingly mobile. And uh, they are yet to urbanize. And as they urbanize, they start to become Chinese, then European, then North American. And you know the economic consequences that come with this. They may not have to urbanize. Uh, in fact, they could stay uh, um, somewhat um, you know, semi-urbanized or unurbanized because of the mobility that is afforded by technology. And last week uh, in a visit to Nairobi, when I got into the taxi cab, he says to me, the Wi-Fi code for the car, the Wi-Fi code for the car uh, is such and such 2014 so that I can work between the airport and uh, the hotel. And if I wanted to bank, uh, I could pull over about every 200 meters to uh, an Impesa outlet where you can transact using, well, Impesa started with uh, that you were transacting with airtime, that instead of sending physical money or very expensive money, you could transact by sending your mom-in-law, uh, and it is your mom-in-law, um, uh, airtime, and then she could cash in that airtime. And they, with Safaricom, they have now, uh, they've now migrated that so the transfer now is financial. One shilling one Kenyan shilling to open an Impesa bank account as one US cent. Hey? This is a huge disruptor to industries. Kodak moment. <laughs> Kodak moment. And think of the South African banking industry. And I'm not making a forecast here about South African banking, but if you think about the South African banking industry, it sits with huge legacy in the physical infrastructure that banks historically have been physical in South Africa. So the big four in South Africa sit with a very, very expensive uh, 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 real estate footprint. And second, the architecture has been built over 20, 30, 40 years. And they're spending lots of money to try and get this architecture to talk to each other. And Peza says, well, first, we don't need uh, outlets. We'll just rent whoever wants to be an Impesa agent can open a store. And to be an Impesa agent, all you need is a bucket of uh, green paint and uh, black paint. The green paint to paint your building, that says it's an Impesa outlet, and then Impesa painted in black. Now you're a bank. <laughs> How cool is that? And um, one shilling to open a bank account. And the system talks to itself because it's been built in the last three or four years. So there's no legacy. And you think of Capitec's advantage over the other banks in South Africa. 
Anyway, uh, you know, the, the proposal is that this increasing mobility means that people may not have to urbanize to become socially included and economically integrated, that you can actually do things remotely. This shows you 3G licenses in sub-Saharan Africa. The cost of data is plummeting, and uh, the cost of data in Kenya is substantially lower than South Africa, substantially lower. Uh, helped in part by increased competition and much more bandwidth. Last uh, two years, more bandwidth arrived on the east coast of sub-Saharan Africa than serves Australia. So that's, you know, these are the types of things that's, that, that are going on. And you can now connect uh, to people all over the place. So the Twitter sphere, LinkedIn, Facebook, mobile banking, and increasingly things like uh, uh, remote education. Sebastian Thrun, the chap who built Google's driverless car, moved to Stanford University in 2011, and he taught his first uh, online course. It's called a MOOC. That's the acronym, Massive Open Online Course. So he taught his first MOOC in artificial intelligence. If you speak to a techie, if you speak to a propeller head and you ask them, would they like to do a postgraduate course in artificial intelligence at Stanford University with Sebastian Thrun, there's a good chance that the answer to that question is yes. What are your chances of doing it? Zero. I would say that your chance of doing it is actually closer to 100% because all you need is 3G connection. And in 2011, Sebastian Thrun had 160 thousand students sign up for his postgraduate program in artificial intelligence. And for fun, I did a postgrad course in, uh, uh, in economic integration at a Spanish university earlier this year. It was taught in English, fortunately. But yeah, so, you know, I was go, go home and tell Kerry, my wife, I'm, I'm going to do a postgrad course in, uh, in Spain. <laughs> Here's your suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Sebastian Thrun has 160,000 students do this course. The cost of doing the course is zero. There's no fee to do the course. You just have to uh, be able to, I uh, almost said dial up, which is very 1980s. <laughs> you just have to connect and uh, you, know, you take yourself through the course. The fallout rate is high. You know, the fallout rate is... Uh, as much as 80 or 90 percent, because there isn't the discipline of being in the room, I'm checking your assignments, we've got syndicate meetings, and so on. Uh, it still uh, resulted in 7,000 students graduating from his uh, first cohort, including one chap in the DRC uh, who uh, went through the program. And Sebastian Thrun says it would have taken him 40 years to teach that course in a physical environment. Instead, he did it in one, one year remotely. So these are the types of things that are going on. You know, remote uh, medicine, uh, remote education, uh, uh, remote banking, remote insurance. You can test your crop prices now and so know what supply chains look like and so on. And this translates into these economies becoming brick-like. And we spend a lot of time obsessing about Brazil, Russia, India, China, or more recently, the mints, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey. They are interesting cases, but as much as we obsess about the BRICS, there are another 160 countries that make up emerging markets. What's going on in those other 160? And when we talk about sub-Saharan Africa, the obsession is Nigeria. There's another 42 countries that you can talk about. And how are they doing? Canon's appetite is to go and look at the countries that others aren't looking at, as much as it is to look at companies that others aren't looking at. But for Nigeria as the poster child, this shows you Nigeria's reported economic growth until early this year versus uh, India. So Nigeria looks Indian uh, in terms of its economic trajectory. That's pretty impressive. But you know that Nigeria did an economic rebasing uh, and for those who are interested in the economic detail, 
the rebasing looks like this. The way economists measure the size of an economy is they look at, they, they, they sample the economy. We can't measure everything. So they sample the economy. They sample tax returns. They sample industry surveys. They sample VAT collections uh, and so on. The last time Nigeria sampled their economy to figure out what the structure looks like was in 1990. And in 90, they had 1 million landlines and zero mobile connections. Today, they still have a million landlines <laughs> and they have 100 million mobile connections, but they hadn't sampled those. So the Nigerian economy is resampled in 2014 or rebased on this new sample in 2014. Telecoms go from 0.9% of GDP to 9% of GDP. And that's what happens to the Nigerian economy. It's actually 80% bigger than historically estimated. <laughs> Growing faster than China. Hence the fascination with Nigeria. And these structural factors, these structural elements, uh, our, arg our argument to you is that these structural elements are exactly that. And when uh, we use the term structural, you can think of engineering principles, a permanence uh, about them. These are lines in concrete, not lines in air or water or sand. And by virtue of that permanence, it uh, equips us to now go in search of businesses and ideas that are likely to participate in this structural transformation. And we've put this under uh, four main uh, ingredients that increasingly these economies will engage with each other and the rest of the world. That capital will seek out these opportunities. That ideas will move more and more to harness and fuel uh, these social and economic prospects. And that ultimately people are the engine of economic transformation. So this is the TCIP framework, trade, capital, information, and people flows. And what businesses then are likely to participate in that? Those are our thoughts about the, those are our thoughts about the, the environment. If Kodak had stepped back and said, so what's going on? Now that we have some perspective on what's going on, we can step in and say, okay, what are we going to do about it? Let me pause for a moment um, and ask if there's any questions or observations. There's people watching remotely, so I'll repeat them. Are we going to... Any thoughts or comments? Nothing. Hi, Adrian. How's it? Good and you? I'm very good. Would you say South Africa perhaps is having its Kodak moment? <laughs> South Africa needs a Kodak moment. Yeah. Um, uh, so some advertising. Maybe Simon will invite us back to talk about the prospects for the South African economy. NDP is lovely policy. Um, no time soon is the South African economy going to produce 6% growth. We simply don't have the structural equipment. We are going to produce 3% growth, but it's not the result of our efforts. The correlation between South Africa's economic growth and world economic growth over the last 20 years is 0 0.9. 0 0.9. And the, the single guide for South Africa's economic growth, the single steer, is world economic growth. It's not what we're doing. It's what's being done to us. Uh, for that reason, I'm not full of despair because the world economy is actually in reasonable shape. There's a billion people who are in trouble because they've bankrupted themselves. I mean, they've become so uh, gorged in debt they took the debt dessert trolley back to their hotel room. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, the, the <laughs> Jeff likes that one. <laughs> so the, um, the rich guys are bankrupt, but they're only a billion people. There's another six billion people, and I'm not saying every single rich country is in trouble. Estonia is in great shape, but they're only a million people. 
and not every emerging country is in superb shape. Um, uh, the emerging countries generally, though, are in much better shape than they were 20 years ago. And in aggregate, more of them are in good shape than bad shape. The emerging countries now contribute more than half of world GDP. And they're growing at five and six per annum. The rich guys are doing one and two GDP growth, and they contribute the other half. So half of six and half of one is three and a half percent economic growth. There's South Africa's economic growth. But um, you've pressed the button, sorry. But, uh, uh, but the, the Kodak moment for South Africa is this economic growth that we've experienced in the last 20 years. Our last 20-year economic growth rate is 3.2% per annum. The 20 years before that was one and a half. So the ANC administration has experienced a substantial improvement in the health of the economy. We have gone from being random in our economic uh, growth performance versus the rest of the world. We were all over the road. Didn't matter what the world economy was doing. We were doing our own thing. We were going to head in a handbasket, crossing the Rubicon, $800 per ounce gold. Rand was collapsing, then $1,000 platinum and so on. And that translated into 1.5% growth per annum in the last 20 years of the apartheid regime. So the ANC administration has overseen a very healthy structural transformation. But the single missing ingredient is this growth has been exclusive. The Gini coefficient in South Africa today is the same as 94. And this economy hasn't created a job in 20 years. This, this is a... This is an accident waiting to happen. And Marikana, the platinum strike, are these are cameo appearances of what could transpire unless South African society, not government, South African society wakes up to this reality. Sorry, I've, but I'm, let me manage myself. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> There's an ex-student pressing buttons. <laughs> okay. Is there time for another quick question? Or are we okay? Okay. So let me show you the, the investment ideas. The, 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 the point here is simply this. I, I won't waste time on this. Let me come here and just make this observation. In 2009... The mood was this, and I've made points about Cannon's uh, appetite for sentiment or our aversion to sentiment as a guide, uh, where sentiment is the single biggest steerer of where money should go. We think this is dangerous. Think of sentiment in 2009. Sentiment in 2009 says the advanced world is in big trouble. It's the global financial crisis, and China is emerging. Had you bought the S&P 500 in 2009, you would be up 100%. Had you bought the Shanghai index, you would have done nothing. So don't confuse sentiment with investment opportunity. Um, yeah, okay, I've made the point. Well, I hope I've made the point. <laughs> so here are some ideas in this sub-Saharan environment. This is the engineering business that I made reference to. This engineering business has been in our institutional portfolios for the last three or four years. It's been in our Superdogs portfolio for the last five years, and the company is ELB Group. Uh, it is a well-established company. You can trace its roots all the way back to the 1930s. What they do is they move stuff from pit to port by engineering uh, design, uh, consulting services, and by supplying the equipment that facilitates that mobility. Uh, so these are not miners, these are facilitators that allow stuff to get from A to B. When we invested in ELB for the first time, it had a market cap of 200 million rand. It had cash on balance sheet of 300 million. This is like buying a house for a million bucks and the previous owner left 1.5 million on the bed for you. Uh, why would that happen? That's insane. Well, sometimes the market is insane. Jeff writes these lovely notes called Crazy Mr. Market. Um, and the market sometimes is absolutely crazy. And in uh, the late noughties, Crazy Mr. Market came along and offered us a company for a price less than the cash on the balance sheet. 
you would think that the company was in trouble by virtue of that price. In fact, it wasn't. It was profitable and dividend paying. So we bought it on a single price earnings ratio and uh, a dividend yield of about 4% 4 at the time. They partnered with world-class uh, equipment businesses like Sumitomo. They bring that equipment into South Africa. So it's yellow and blue metal. Uh, the net-net is the reference to Ben Graham, where Ben Graham says you can find companies that have more cash on balance sheet than the company price. And look at the profitability of this business. Its return on equity uh, is 20% per annum after tax. They target pre-tax 30%. So this is a profitable business. Uh, they are consistent in converting the cash, uh, the profit to cash. And we never want to uh, confuse the accumulation of profit with, you know, just because the accountants say it's profit uh, doesn't make it profit. We want to see that as cash also. And uh, by virtue of the company's size, they've partnered recently with uh, DRA, the engineering consulting business, and they form the very clever ac acronym Ardbell which is their 50-50 uh, partnership with DRA. And they go and find projects now cross-border. The extent of their cross-border work is now that it makes up about a third of uh, ELB's business, and they're doing uh, work in uh, Angola, Mozambique, um, in uh, well, actually throughout sub-Saharan Africa. This is what the company looks like today. Market cap of just shy of 1.7 billion. Look at the current assets, 1.5 billion, of which 580 million is cash. So it's no, no longer a Ben Graham net net, but that 1.7, you can offset 600 million in cash. You're actually paying 1.1 for this company, which means the price earnings ratio, whilst it prints at uh, 12 and a half times, if you look through the price earnings ratio, it's closer to about eight times. Uh, price earnings multiple. Uh, management uh, are heavily invested in the company, which we love. Uh, there's no surer guide than uh, managers who eat their own cooking. Uh, and we are encouraged by the fact that uh, management is the controlling shareholder in this company. And this is not the consequence of you know, one single brilliant idea. This is just deliberate, consistent, determined application of their expertise. I can evidence that for you by virtue of the fact that the equity on their balance sheet is uh, 637 million, of which retained earnings makes up 618 million. They've just built this business steadily over the years. No spectacular corporate action. Just let's be good at what we're good at. Uh, James Mwangi uh, starts uh, Kenya's equity bank, and this is a fantastic mobilizer and uh, economic uh, facilitator. Uh, Kenya, whilst I've given the example of Mpesa, Mpesa is a transactions bank in Kenya if you buy something. But if you want to build a business, you need to borrow money, and that's what Kenya's equity bank does. They are the largest bank uh, in sub-Saharan Africa by customer base. They have 8 million customers. They operate in Kenya, Uganda, South Sudan, Rwanda, and Tanzania. The uh, business has grown at just shy of 30% per annum. Half of the book is in small and medium-sized enterprises. So this is not unsecured lending to buy flat screen televisions. This is secured lending to buy businesses. It translates into uh, um, the company having non-performing loans of 4%, just over 4%, the year before, 5%. This is at their last set of results in which they reported 20% earnings growth. The capital adequacy ratio, the CAR, is 17.5%, way in excess of Basel. And if you look at their non-performing loans versus, let's say, who's your favorite non-performing lender right now? Uh, African Bank. Uh, <laughs> Um, Vic, uh, Sam, you told me the number. 31%. So Abel's NPL is 31% and their NPL is 4. And this is an NPL that is better than Capitec, incidentally. The valuation is not uh, demanding despite the fact. So this is where we invested in, um, uh, in Equity Bank. This is the performance recently. It didn't do anything spectacular for... 
the first year or so that we were invested, but recently and after their results, they've done very nicely, up 40% uh, year to date and 25 uh, um, over the last year. But notwithstanding this big improvement, the company is still uh, attractively priced and it sits on uh, a price earnings multiple that is below South African banks with a return on equity of 30%, which is double South African banks' return on equity. If you want to uh, build a shopping center uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have an audience member who can build you a shopping center <laughs> for how much? 10 million. 40 million. 40 million. <laughs> for just 40 million, <laughs> you can build a shopping center. For a more modest amount, you can buy a share in Lafarge, <laughs> which supplies the cement to these shopping centers that are being built. Uh, and I think either prospect, if you've got a spare 40 million, buy a shopping center. <laughs> If you are a fraction of the 40 million, buy the cement that builds the shopping center. And so my argument to you is Lafarge. This is Lafarge uh, Zambia, though. It's not Lafarge Global. It is obviously owned by Lafarge Global, and some of the history of the company is up there. Look at the EBITDA margin. One of the things that we know about can companies in less competed markets is that they boast elevated profit margin. And so Lafarge's EBITDA of 46% compares to PPC's 32. They have no long-term debt. Their return on equity is 35%. This is an ungeared, highly profitable business with a strong competitive margin because of its geographic location and uh, its market share and the structural support of the Zambian economy, which is growing at 8% per annum. Cash generation is one and a half times earnings. So you'll see this, this is a recurring uh, theme in Canon's investment appetite is we want cash because you can't eat accounting profit. And uh, the compound annual growth is 29% over the last five years. 29 KGAR means that this is doubling about every three and a half years. It's doubling. So the, you don't have to rush to the moon. You know, you can get there, uh, I think, in safe, sensible ways. The enterprise value to EBITDA at the moment is 10 and a half times, and the dividend yield is, is four. The five-year shareholder return is 49%, which means this is doubling your return every two years. But that's backward-looking, keep in mind. Okay. Even though that's backward-looking, the multiples aren't, uh, aren't demanding. And then, um, uh, sorry, uh, One Logics is our last idea. One Logics is uh, in Lawrence's business, and we've been invested in One Logics for a number of years in our Superdogs portfolio. Uh, One Logics has recently been added to our institutional portfolios. And if you want to get an idea of what One Logics does, you could think of um, something like Baby Supergroup or Imperial or yeah, maybe Supergroup or Imperial or parts of Supergroup or Imperial historically. We love the fact that One Logics uh, is off the board in terms of the conversations about uh, the investment environment. Ian's here. <laughs> it's lovely that you're here. <laughs> maybe I should give the microphone to you. <laughs> Uh, so correct me where I'm wrong. <laughs> um, suddenly I have to be that much more careful. <laughs> this is the world's best business. <laughs> it has been acquired or invested by one of the world's best investment managers. <laughs> uh, so One Logics lists on the JSC in 2000. It moved to the main board recently. So it spent most of its history on Altex. Uh, the migration to the main board is testimony to the stewardship and management uh, uh, of the company, its integrity, its stature. Uh, One Logics uh, starts its life as PostNet and um, then migrates and iterates. One of the attributes that we love about One Logics is uh, again, this is sort of a recurrent theme in Canon's investment style, is we are very shy or fearful of businesses that have grand strategies or single big ideas. 
Instead, what you see uh, this business do over the years under uh, Ian's stewardship is uh, make iterative acquisitions and very often the new ideas aren't uh, acquired. They're actually built inside of, of the business. And they're small ideas that as they start to take root, uh, you haven't fired the cannonball because if you fire the cannonball and you get it wrong, you're out of ammo. And that's what brilliant single big strategy ideas turn into when you get that idea wrong. And instead, you know, our take on One Logics is it is this very successful iterative innovator. And they attach and build businesses off that initial footprint. So the competitive strength, the cash flow, uh, the market share of PostNet is, uh, I'm going to have a go at describing PostNet and you'll forgive me. I, I'm going to pretend that you're not in the room. Um, uh, the the PostNet is able to fund other businesses, so they build um, uh, VDS, which is vehicle delivery services, which moves uh, vehicles across border and the countries that they deliver to here, you'll get the theme. Uh, more recently, commercial vehicle delivery services, which does exactly that, commercial vehicles. And from there, further iterations, including delivering now infrastructure um, uh, across borders or infrastructural components. But I think the cleverness of the strategy is if you think about PostNet, um, these are my words, not Ian's, is PostNet is essentially a courier business that has got the single biggest fleet in the country because most courier businesses have a fleet of vehicles which are used to get and do this uh, spoken hub uh, type service. Instead, with PostNet, the courier fleet is called us and we get the parcels from our office or our homes to PostNet and then we go and collect them from PostNet. Uh, I think that it's a stroke of strategic brilliance um, in terms of giving the business agility and sustainability. So here is the success of the company, evidenced by, once again, no surprise, not accounting profit, but cash flow from operations. So you see the CFO is the uh, gray line with the black spots versus operating income. Here's a nice takeaway that these numbers aren't being manufactured. These numbers are being delivered in the form of cash flow. But one of the things that particularly caught our attention in recent times is that uh, OneLogix acquired 10% of their own shares back from uh, Izingwe, which is a, a, a structural, uh, which is a structure that existed for an empowerment transaction. This was done in the last quarter of last year at 250 cents a share. Um, and uh, you haven't cancelled the shares, no. Uh, but those shares were acquired at 250 cents. The current price is four rand. And that was just uh, six or seven months ago. So those are our ideas. Um, we hope that they give you food for thought. And we hope that they help you have uh, the exact opposite of whatever the opposite of Kodak moments are. Thank you for your time and your attention. There's lots of my colleagues here tonight, Victor and Sam and Doug, who put to this evening together. Thank you for, for all your hard work. Jeff is here. So please, if there's anything that you'd like to explore further with us, um, please grab us. And thanks so much for your time and interest in, in this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian.